Okay, guys, it's a, uh, at the moment, sunny day in the bluegrass, but just a minute ago, it was pouring rain, because uh, I know you're wondering why I'm wearing a rain jacket <laughs> in the sunshine. Uh, this is some fickle weather we're having here. Sometimes it's pouring rain, sometimes it's sunny, and uh, the difference might be five minutes. And that's why I have time to talk to you today, is because all my clients canceled on me because it was pouring rain earlier. You know, and my clients might cancel on me, but me and Eli is going to be out here doing work. Ain't that right, Eli? Every day, right? Now, what we want to talk to you about today is the fact that big does not equal mature. And so what we have here, stand up there for him, Butch. This is an Anatolian Shepherd, and uh, you saw him in my last video. Okay, guys, I what I want you to understand is that this dog is not very much older than this dog, okay? This Anatolian Shepherd is maybe 22 weeks old. This Black Malinois is maybe 16 weeks old. So that's pretty close in age, pretty close in developmental stage. <laughs> And so what we're going to talk about a little bit is, uh, you know, how you go about setting realistic standards for your particular dog and how you got to make sure that you don't allow, like, cursory things get in the way of setting realistic standards. Like, so, you know, to the untrained eye, this big dog, big butchie here, he looks mature. I mean, he's bigger than any of the other dogs here that are adults. And so it's easy to look at him and think that he's an adult, but he's not. He's a baby. As a matter of fact, he's, he's pretty immature. And uh, these giant breeds of dogs like this, they're always pretty, you know, kind of like they're giant puppies their whole lives, really. And so when you're working with them, you have to really take into account this particular breed or whatever giant breed it is, their particular genetic predispositions towards learning and performance. So I want you to watch me walk, walk uh, Big Butchie here. Now you notice I'm really loading him up on the treats. I'm very supportive with him. I'm helping him. I'm helping guide him through these exercises. Very nice, okay? And the reason is, is because these exercises are a lot harder for Butch than they are the smaller, more athletic, more compact dogs. Butch is what's known as a livestock guardian breed. Okay. And so in other words, like, <sighs> This type of dog was developed for its ability to just hang out on the farm and keep evildoers away, right? That's it. You know, nobody's really, really thinking in terms of how, how handler sensitive are Anatolian Shepherds, you know, how agile are Anatolian Shepherds. No, it's just a matter of what kind of job can they do keeping evildoers away from the farm. That's it, that's their, that's their, that's their whole purpose. But now these dogs not only live in farms, but they kind of, you know, they kind of, they live on farms and they're, they have kind of uh, more cultured expectations placed on them, you know. Uh, people expect dogs nowadays to be a little bit more friendly. They expect dogs to be uh, able to engage in a wider variety of social situations than the people that originally bred these dogs, you know, were thinking about, okay. And so I get these kind of big dogs every once in a while. Not all, not, not too often, because they're pretty, still pretty uncommon. But when they come out here, I have to really make sure that I explain to my staff that these dogs are going to be very big. And uh, they're going to be, you know, for the most part, very biddable, but for short periods of time. Right? So when we're walk, working Butch, like we have to really factor in... Uh, you know how quickly he gets fatigued and not just mentally fatigued because he again he's not a breed that's bred to do you know uh, complex behaviors with a handler right we have to take into account how quickly he gets physically fatigued and you can see just after a trip around the course you see he's kind of starting to get uh, you know a little bit tired he was a little bit more deliberate with his steps in the way that he came up here on the exam table those are things that you have to think about when you're designing your training regimen. This is a giant breed of dog, and he's only going to be able to get... What are you nerds over there doing? Right? Okay, so look at this nerd. <laughs> this German short hair. I always got to be interrupting my video. They're either running in and out of the frame, chasing butterflies, or they're off over there wrestling and barking and carrying on. Okay, again, breed-specific tendency, guys. You have to, if you're going to be a good dog trainer, you have to understand what the breed that you're working with how they develop physically and mentally. So with Big Butch, I know that he takes a lot of support and I know that he takes a lot of repetition because it's not a pattern cognizant breed, but I also know that I'm gonna have to adjust my session and repetition schedule to fit the dog's energy output level, right? This is a giant dog. Like I said, he's not much older than, like say, this dog here or Castle, the Malinois. 
But imagine the work that's going on inside this body to make it grow so fast. That's where all his calories are going right now. So he doesn't have a lot of excess calories left to get lots of sessions in. I mean, lots of repetitions in per session. So a little dog like this, who's a year old stinker, right? Okay, I can get lots of repetitions with him. Sophia, a year old dog, I can get a lot of repetitions with her. Sadie, 14 weeks, I can get a fair amount of repetitions with her. Augie, come here Augie. Look, this is a German short hair. <laughs> I can get as many, I can literally work this dog one session, uh, 10 hours. I can just start in the morning and work him for 10 hours straight and he would probably still be performing at a pretty high level. Okay, that's not true with these giant breeds of dogs. So when you go to train in a giant breed, you have to schedule your training so that you have a lot of sessions per day, but a short number of repetitions per session, okay? And th th those are just things that you have to learn as you're working with dogs. <laughs> Each of these types of dogs, you got a cockapoo, you got a couple of labs, you got this Anatolian Shepherd, they all mature differently, both physically and mentally. And you have to take that into consideration when you're choosing your training strategy and your training techniques. Um, let, me, let me show you a, another for instance. Okay, so I got this treat pouch on, and you saw how many treats I was given uh, Big Butch. All right, so I'm going to take this treat pouch and uh, put it over here out of the way. And uh, let's see who we could do. Let's take uh, Castle, for instance. Oh, a little Castle. All right, Castle, he's a, he's a little over a month younger than Big Butch, okay? But where I'm still loading Big Butch, Butch up with the treats and I'm walking very slowly and I'm making all my movements very deliberate, okay? That's not the case with this Malinois because he's a shorter, more compact, more pattern cognizant dog that's bred to have a high energy output, a high endurance level, and a quick recharge rate. In other words, this dog specifically been bred to be able to expend a lot of energy for a long time and not take very long to recover, right? Come on, little castle! And so you can see up, 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 that even without the treats, 16 weeks old, even without the treats, oh my gosh, castle is a willing worker and he's able to come over here and perform with a relatively high degree of speed and precision. Hup, 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 hup. So I can get lots of repetitions per session in with him. Wait, good, easy. And I can fade off of my treat work with him very quickly because dogs like this are bred to be internally motivated. They're bred to have intrinsic levels of motivation that say a livestock guardian breed doesn't have. This dog, once you start to teach it a pattern, then the exhibition of that pattern becomes self-reinforcing. The dog enjoys the work. That's why you hear a lot of people talk about these dogs. They call them working dogs, you know. That's not by chance, right? And that's not because the people that train these dogs, uh, you know, are necessarily, you know, magic trainers, right? I mean, there's a reason. I've said this in my other videos, there's a reason dog trainers choose certain kind of dogs because certain kind of dogs make dog trainers look good. Same thing with horse trainers. You don't see horse trainers just randomly showing up with Clydesdales at the uh, Kentucky Derby, you know? No, you, you see racehorse trainers pick racehorses that are going to be fast, right? You see dog trainers pick dogs that are going to be able to perform at a high level with speed and precision and a low number of maintenance reps. And why do you have to have a low number of maintenance repetitions as a professional dog trainer? Because your job is to be training other people's dogs. So by the time you get home from training all their dogs, you really don't have a lot of inclination to train your own. So you want to be able to train them when they're young and that training to stick forever. Come on, up, 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 up. Oh, up, up, up. And, uh, you know, you don't want to, like, the reason that you need a high uh, energy output and a high endurance rate, up, 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 is because, like, when, you know, you're working during the day, right, you want to be able to go from client to client to client and have the dog perform at a level that makes clear the techniques that you're using to the client, okay? Now, past why dog trainers pick this kind of dog, right, you, for working purposes, dog handlers like in the military or in police pick this kind of dog and they need those same qualities. They need a dog that's capable of expending a high level of energy over a long period of time and having a quick uh, recharge rate. Okay, And not only that but they need the dogs to be able to be shown a particular pattern and to be able to repeat that pattern over and over and over through the day. So not only does the dog need physical uh, endurance, it needs mental endurance. Okay, And that's why when you're training a dog like this, right? Your training seems to progress 
a lot more quickly. And when you're training a dog like this, your training seems to progress a lot more slowly. I would challenge you to look at it in a diff from a different perspective though. I would just say that when we're judging success for this kind of dog, we keep in mind what the end result needs to be. And when we're training this dog, we keep in mind what the end result needs to be. This dog lives on a big horse farm, and all I need for him to do is be friendly with the people that work on the horse farm and the animals that live there, right? And to be unfriendly towards the people that don't work there and are not supposed to visit, and the animals that don't live there and are not supposed to visit. This dog here, we have an entirely different end game in mind. So when you're picking your training strategy, when you're making choices related to dog training techniques, when you're making choices designed to your session schedule and your repetitions per session schedule, okay, I want you to keep in mind that big is not mature and that you cannot escape the breed specific tendencies of the type of dog that you're training. So make the appropriate choices, get out there, keep that in mind, be successful, send us some videos. See you later.